all of a sudden that stability wasn't there for me anymore. All of a sudden I started worrying about losing my sponsors, losing my career. How am I going to make money? And through that process, realizing that whatever happens is going to happen. And it's really all what you make of it. And realizing that even though I was going to have this injury and let's say I had to get a completely new career, I was going to be okay. This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, where we hear stories of adventure from every corner of the planet. We interview all sorts of folks who are using their sport to explore the world around them and give you the inspiration you need to get out there and have some fun. Hey folks, I hope you're doing well out there. I hope you're staying safe. Thank you for tuning in. I know there's a million things you could be doing right now. Well, maybe not right now. A lot of us are sitting around. Nonetheless, if you're healthy, if you're safe, that's a huge blessing. You know, I feel like uh, we've been covering just coronavirus a little too much lately. I'm sure you're just sick of it in a lot of ways and want to focus on other things. So uh, I, I figured, you know, let's stop talking about it. It's hard not to because it obviously is world changing and a huge deal and affecting all of us. But, you know, a lot of you are looking for this, you look towards shows like this for inspiration and maybe to not think about stuff for just a little while. So I wanted to bring you this brand new episode. It is with Mark Abma, who is a legendary free skier, just highly, highly respected in the sport. And he's a great guy, tons of interesting uh, hobbies and lots of interests. And so we have a great time talking. He joins us today from Whistler, British Columbia, which is his home. And this, this interview is actually from my other show, which is Without Compromise, which is through Athletic Brewing, where I work uh, my day job. And uh, every once in a while, we get a guest on the show that would just make a great adventure sports podcast guest, and Mark was one of them. So I decided to use that interview for this. So I hope you enjoy. We do some rapid fire stuff at the very end of the show. Yeah, just a fun interview. So stay safe out there. Enjoy. Feel free to get in touch with the show if you need anything, have any ideas, any suggestions. Info at adventuresportspodcast.com. All right, here's the episode. First of all, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. You grew up skiing in Canada, correct? And, and if so, like, yeah, were you taught anything there? Or was it just kind of like go out there and, and and try your best? I grew up skiing an hour and a half east of Vancouver. It's a tiny hill relative to Whistler. It's uh, maybe 1,100 vertical feet, which I guess is big for the East Coast. But um, it's only two chairlifts. And... I was I was very fortunate that I, I joined a freestyle club there, and I had a couple really great coaches that steered me in the right direction. Going into the freestyle club, I already knew that I loved skiing, but these guys really kind of... Uh, I had one coach that had a racing background, another coach that was uh, primarily a freestyle skier. And so I was able to kind of meld the two, those two techniques. And, uh, and so I pursued mogul skiing and then with where I grew up skiing, there was some backcountry there and not that people were really going there. And so myself and a couple of buddies, we'd duck ropes on powder days and we'd go climb around and go get ourselves into trouble. So there was definitely some structure in my life, but then there was also a part of my, my childhood when I was skiing where I was just, I was exploring and trying to figure out how to ski a spine or how to jump off a cliff and totally winging it. Um, but I feel like I, I watched so many ski movies and I looked up to the likes of Seth Morrison and I did my best to mimic his style. And so I really worked on that for, for a long time. Was it clear early on you had talent or, or did you have to work pretty hard to, to keep up? Um, I would say I do have some talent, definitely not comparative to a lot of, the people out there i would say there's definitely people that i ski with that are that are phenoms and i wouldn't describe myself as a phenom skiing is definitely something that I, I connected with but i did have to work for it i did have to crash a lot but thankfully my dad gave me a strong work ethic and i was willing to <laughs> continually beat myself up get back up and and do it over again uh, and found pleasure in that for whatever reason 
<laughs> and um, and slowly start piecing it together. And what were you? What was the goal then? What were you trying to do? Just just acquire the next skill, you know, ski the next more difficult line. Like what was it? You know, it was interesting. I, I bumped into one of my buddy's dads that started the freestyle club that I first joined, and he mentioned that when I first showed up when I was thirteen, that my goal then was to be in a Warren Miller movie. And I don't remember that. So it's really cool to hear that. So I guess from an early age, that was something I wanted to do. And then, you know, through joining the Freestyle Club, I had ambitions of just learning how to do 360s and Cossacks and a better Daffy and, you know, all those tricks that we were working on back in the day. I didn't really know where that was going to take me. I thought maybe I would get into becoming a ski patrol. And then all of a sudden I got a a phone call with an invite to join the, the BC provincial ski team or freestyle ski team and so with that i moved to whistler and then all of a sudden i started getting some some formal training where we were in the gym five days a week all the way through the fall and then we we're on a, a competitive circuit pretty much uh, week in week out for for three to four months and so that gave me a lot of structure and a great workout and training regime that i still carry with me to this day oh, oh really so what 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 would you what do you do now that you did then uh, well, I'm still in the gym quite often. Okay. I would say, you know, my training has evolved, but I still come back to some of the basics that I was doing back then, which is squats and deadlifts. And ultimately just knowing how far I can push myself before I've gone too far and you start doing uh, more harm than good. And I feel like that that foundation that training gave me is what's kind of molded my body into what I'm in today. And I still just try to hang on to that basic foundation because it's worked for me for so long. So with that, I've, I have evolved with my training where I've got into less weight and less bulk that I'm trying to create with my body and more more balance, more uh, strength to weight ratio. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned you know you're still doing those things because because I, I feel like when you watch any sort of sport, even you know professional sports of any kind, they're pretty much doing the same things you're taught in like little league and in the little kids. It's section, you know, the little kids era, it's just they're, they've perfected it and they're masters of those fundamentals. And there's really not a whole lot you learn as much as it is just being reminded of what you already know, even at the highest level. I don't, I don't know if that's the same for skiing. Yeah, it is. You know, there's, there's so many different styles of training and working out now and they're really fun and it is nice to switch it up. But uh, at the end of the day, it is nice to come back to those basic fundamentals because they, they do strengthen those those core muscle groups, which, you know, generally speaking, will help prevent injuries. Absolutely. And so, and so how long into that experience were you, you know, found by Matchstick Productions? Because I know you have an ongoing relationship with them over, all, you know, nearly two decades now. Was that mm-hmm. kind of one of your big breaks, you would say? And, and what was that experience like? Yeah, so I went from being a competitive mogul skier. I did that for a few years. And then with that, I spent quite a bit of time on the East Coast in Ontario and Quebec competing. The conditions there aren't always favorable. <laughs> and so, but meanwhile, I was seeing the snow forecast back in Whistler and it just kept calling me back. So eventually I realized it was time for me to move on from being a mogul skier and start focusing on spending more time in the terrain park because during that time we had the likes of the Canadian Air Force coming up and they're developing all these new tricks and the twin tip had been developed and so that just kind of sparked a whole new level of interest for me in skiing and so I moved back to Whistler and kind of started from the basics you know I lived on a futon that winter I worked at a ski shop I was a ski coach and then in between that, I was just in the train park jumping as much as possible. And it didn't come that quickly for me. You know, I was doing a couple of regional events. I was doing okay. And then, then I did that for a couple of years. I'm just kind of chipping away, doing whatever events I could get into. I think it was 2003 that I went to the U.S. Open and got a good result there. I think I got fourth in slope and big air, something of the sort. And then that kind of helped propel me just getting to the next level where I could start going into getting involved with photo shoots and whatnot. And a good buddy of mine took me under his wing and brought me out to this event called uh, Super Park and Parkosaurus, which is kind of a gathering of all the pros and film crews and photographers. And I met uh, the team manager for K2 there. And so as soon as I got into that kind of relationship, then all of a sudden, 
you know, they kind of encouraged me to keep doing more competing. So the next year I'm going to X Games. And it was around that time where I started getting noticed a little bit more by uh, a couple different film companies and, and Matchstick being one of them. So I, I first started filming park segments with Matchstick. And then the next year I uh, got a call to join them to go heli skiing in Bella Coola. And that was the trip that forever changed my life. Had you ever done anything like that before? You know, skiing around Whistler, I got to dabble in with some mini golf, but hardly anything to the, the magnitude of Bella Coola. The mountains in Bella Coola are quite, quite substantial. And so when I first got there, I was, I was scared shitless and I was kind of in over my head mentally, I would say, because I remember getting dropped off at <laughs> the top of the mountain and I was terrified. Just getting out of the helicopter was a horrifying experience because you're, you're being dropped off in this knife edge peak and you've got 3,000 feet below you and you can't even really see where you're supposed to go because the mountain literally just kind of rolls away. Was that safe given your skills at the time? I mean, were you, could you do this? I mean, I mean, obviously you did, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, was this just a huge liability on their end? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think having spent some time in the Whistler area and having some experience with, with mini golf, eventually you got to make that, that leap. Okay. And it's a bit of leap of faith on my behalf. And I'm sure jumping out of the nest. Totally. Right. And then eventually it's, there's, there's no easy way to do it. And I kind of got thrown in the lion's den or in the lion's den, but I did have some great mentors there being the likes of Shane McConkey and Hugo Harrison and actually Inger Backstrom, who's, it was her first heli trip, I believe, as well. So both of us were, were green coming in. And we both ended up having an amazing trip. And I believe we both, um, I ended up winning male performance of the year. And she got female performance of the year, largely because of the, the footage that we acquired from that trip. What was it like for you doing that for the first time? Like, what, how, how could you describe it to people compared to what you had experienced up to that point? <laughs> I guess I was probably in a bit of a state of fight or flight, you know, like you're in full survival mode up there, really. But at the end of the day, you just have to break it down to kind of simple steps. So with that, when we're flying through the mountains, we, we fly around until we, we find a mountain we want to ski. Then we park the helicopter, everybody gets out, and we'll spend anywhere from 5 to 20 minutes uh, scoping of that mountain, picking our lines, and determining exactly how we're going to get down it. And we take a photo of it, which is pretty funny because you probably imagine what a digital camera looked like back in 2004. <laughs> the, the, the screen was like an inch by an inch. <laughs> but that was all you had. So you take a photo of that, and then you get dropped off in the top. And then it's kind of interesting because you're, you're now looking at the mountain kind of in reverse from what you were looking at when you were across the valley. So now you're flipping it around and you're on top of it. You're trying to match landmarks that you were seeing from across the valley to what you think you're seeing from the top of the mountain. And so you go into your camera and you're like, all right, that should be that rock. That should be that rock. That's that cliff. That's that spot. And basically doing a connect the dot as to how to get down. And, you know, communicating back and forth with the filmers just to ensure that you are, in fact, looking at the right feature. Because you can get lost up there because there is that blind rollover effect and it's really not a place where you want to get lost. And then with that, you're coming up with a plan A as to, you know, if everything's going well, plan B being what if an avalanche happens? Um, plan C, what if you crash in a certain spot and you've got exposure below you? So you're always trying to lay out all these plans and then really just take some deep breaths and trust that you've got it all put together in your mind and you know where to go. And really from there, then you kind of get into that flow state and you kind of put a lot of trust into to your own abilities at that point. It's just, it's an intense energy being in, in those kind of mountains and getting dropped off in those peaks. Yeah, it's kind of a scary thing. But I do remember the first time that I got dropped off, I was, you know, on top of this really big face and I made it to the bottom and the, the shot didn't make the movie. But it was such a huge release of energy. I remember getting to the bottom and I just let out this massive primal scream of just <laughs> releasing all this pent up energy and probably years and years of anticipation to be able to reach that moment. You, you didn't do that much on the moguls then? No. <laughs> <laughs> 
I guess that intensity just didn't really exist on the Mulga course, I suppose. Do you, do you think being out in the wilderness had something to do with it? Yeah, I think there was, there's just so much power in those mountains and there's a lot of, uh, humility that comes with that. And so when you survive, it's probably just, you know what I mean? I, I can't stand when you say you conquer something outdoors, like you don't conquer yeah. it. You, you, it lets you climb it. Okay? Totally. And I'm That's sure it was it, something right? like that for you where it was, you know, just, I survived, I did it. I had this enormous yeah. activation energy to get over this fear, but I did it. And I mean, yeah, I can see how that just could totally flip your script on life. And, and so from there, like, wh- I mean, what... You know, I know, I know that you've, you've had a long time and a lot of maturity has happened between now and then, and you're looking back at a lot of that now, um, you know, just, was it just a constant progression of, you know, where else can I go? What's, what's happening next year? Um, stoke after stoke and experience after experience. Yeah. I'd say during that initial phase of filming, I was coming out of being a competitive slope style, big air and half life guy. And so. Uh, I had a lot of tricks that I wanted to bring into that big mountain environment and the, and the backcountry environment. And so that became a huge focus of mine for, for a long time. And actually, you know, still to this day is, is something that I put a lot of emphasis into. I'm not necessarily looking to get into bigger mountains. I, I don't really see myself going into the way of wanting to um, get into uh, heavy mountaineering or I, I really, I look for, and I guess I always have looked for mountains that have this beautiful aesthetic that have a spine or a wave or a pillow or a part of the mountain that just naturally looks like you're supposed to go there or you're supposed to jump off that. Or when you are jumping off that, it's going to work itself out perfectly for doing this trick. And so I guess I'm always looking for for lines and mountains that just have that kind of flow to it. and you know, it's me finding congruency with that mountain at that point. And, and I think that's the process that I really enjoy is just uh, just finding flow out there because, you know, it's really easy to kind of get worked up and anxious because we have a short amount of time to try to make these ski films because really at the end of the day, the, the winter isn't that long. And right. then the good days in and amongst that are far and few between. I would say in our filming year, we have maybe a week of good quality filming days. And so you have a lot of pressure on those particular days to try to try to nail it, you know? And so I really try to step aside from that pressure that can come along with that and just really try to focus on, yeah, just finding flow out there and doing things that I'd want to do and not because there's a camera there. Have you always been like that or has it kind of progressed to that point as you got older? No, there was definitely a progression, but I would say there's, I've always had a bit of that in me with regards to when I got into filming. Yeah, and I, and I think I got humbled pretty quickly. I mean, skiing does that, I think. As soon as you start getting too far ahead of yourself or start pushing it too much, then you're going to get broken off pretty quickly. And I think I, I learned that <laughs> pretty, <laughs> right. uh, pretty quickly. So all of a sudden, I realized I need to reel it in a little bit. And I really need to continue to focus on having fun out there because ultimately that's why we're here. And and I think I was kind of blessed with having that that fun perspective in uh, in skiing. I, I mean, you know that, that, that I, I've seen that so many places. You know, reading about you, like you're just out there having a great time. You're not taking it too seriously. Yeah. I mean, do you think that? I mean, it seems. When you're at the top of the ski game, it almost seems like you got to be really intense and driven all the time. And I don't know, it's nice to see someone that is just having a good time. Is that, is that really what's going on inside? Is that how you really feel? And that's how, is that how you always try to treat it? Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll definitely have moments of intensity and, and work ethic where I'm like, all right, we've, it's sunset right now and we've got. 15 minutes to make it happen. Let's hustle, you know, or there'll be those moments throughout the day. I'd say generally speaking throughout the rest of the day, I'm really trying to slow myself down and take myself out of that, that fight or flight mode and keep myself more in my prefrontal cortex where I can continue to think creatively. And, and I think when I'm in that state, that's when I'm skiing my best and I'm having the most fun and, and I'm working 
more effectively with everybody around me. Because at the end of the day, it's we're out there with as a whole crew, and I'm not the only guy. I'm out there with let's say three other skiers, and everybody's trying to have their moment, right? So, so among your group, what are you? What are you? Are you typically the one kind of just keeping quiet, doing your thing, or are you leading the charge? Where where do you usually fall in that? You know, it it totally changes. I think everybody has their moments of leading the charge or listening to their intuition or, and I think that's what I really love about it. You know, I ski with a lot of different people and a lot of different dynamics and I really try to allow everybody to step into their power and whether that's a filmer or photographer and seeing their angle and, and seeing their creativity and really trusting that um, to being with other skiers and, you know, some of them are a little bit more aggressive than others and some are quite passive and sometimes you know you need to encourage people and sometimes you need to step back and let those people that are firing and in that moment really take advantage of that that power that they're in so it's it's really kind of a dance all day you know let's take a quick break and hear from our sponsor roman one of the things i hate the most about doctor's appointments is that i will schedule one and it's literally probably a month later before I can go. And then it's a lot of time before I get results. And honestly, you know, being a guy, I don't go to the doctor all that often. I think, oh my gosh, I think it's been years, literally years since I've been to the dentist or the doctor. And I definitely have some issues I need to seek treatment on. I just, I don't know, I did procrastinate in that department. And if you're dealing with something like erectile dysfunction, that procrastination is not going to pay off in the long run. Let's just put it that way. Good news is Roman has been spending years trying to solve this by building a digital platform that connects you with a doctor who's licensed in your state, all from the comfort of your home. So they make it convenient to get a treatment you need and on your schedule. So just grab your phone and really all you have to do is use your phone or computer and you complete a free online visit and you'll hear back from a U.S. licensed physician within 24 hours. And if doctor decides that treatment is right for you, Roman's Pharmacy can ship your medication to you free in just two days. So you don't even need to leave your house on one hand is great because I I love to work. I'm a workaholic, so I want to work. I don't want to take time out of my day to go to the doctor, take care of myself. I kind of just want it shipped to me. You know, we're in this Amazon culture and it's awesome to get stuff sent to us. And Roman has figured that out when it comes to dealing with erectile dysfunction. And obviously there's no commitments. You can cancel any time. So if you're struggling with ED, go to getroman.com slash ASP for a free online visit and free two-day shipping. That's getroman.com slash ASP. A S P for a free online visit and free two day shipping. And that is also in the show notes. All right. Thank you. And let's get back to the episode. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> so it's so I, fun. Yeah. It's, I mean, yeah, exactly. It's fun. That's what you got to be having. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> you know, and I know you're also really into, um, I know you you practice sustainability and mm-hmm. um, not just in your lifestyle, but also with your body, you know, with longevity and just yeah. did, did those two passions for, for both your lifestyle as well as your body, did they kind of start happening together or, or is it something like, like with uh, having fun, it's always been a part of it or were these things that, that began to, be, you began to be more conscious of as you got older? Yeah, I think that was a, a slow awakening between treating my body better and wanting to become more active with regards to uh, sustainability, with regards to renewable energy and whatnot. They both slowly started happening at the same time. Did anything happen for you to take, you know, say, I got to take better care of my body? Well, I would say there was a time where I had a, a breakup. <laughs> all right and um, usually pivotal moments and people yeah lives, something you know? <laughs> right yeah that's it and and for me it was it was a challenging time and so it kind of forced me to go inside myself and so i started listening to the likes of eckhart tolle started reading self-help books books about spirituality started getting into yoga and meditation and so all this stuff just started kind of bubbling inside of me and all of a sudden i started having more uh, 
uh, inspiration and motivation to wanting to live off grid and to wanting to drive my vehicle on waste vegetable oil. And so all this sort of, all these things just started kind of bringing a whole new sense of inspiration and curiosity for myself. And it was, it's a really fun and exciting time when all of a sudden you start discovering something new about yourself that really, really resonated with me. So it was, uh, and it's something that I still carry with me every day. Yeah. Letting something like a breakup become something so positive is, oh, that's, that's fantastic. And, uh, yeah, you mentioned a lot of things and actually, uh, you mentioned uh, your truck. Could, could you tell people about your truck real quick? It's, it's really cool. Yeah, totally. So I bought a, it's a 2006 GMC Duramax diesel truck. I converted it to run on waste vegetable oil. So I go around to restaurants and I collect their old deep frying oil after they've made French fries and chicken wings and uh, go to the back of sushi restaurants because they've been making tempura, whatever it may be. And I bring it home and I clean that oil and then I put it into my truck and my truck runs on that oil because diesel engines were actually designed to run on a variety of different oils so that farmers could make their own fuel from peanut oil, I believe was the first one that they were looking to utilize for, for tractors and whatnot. And so that was back in 2000 and well, 2010, I first started running my truck in biodiesel. And then I realized that waste vegetable oil was a, a simpler process to make fuel. And so I first took my truck on its maiden voyage to Alaska and back on waste vegetable oil, which was How did uh, it do? a pretty rad mission. It did great, man. I mean, <laughs> to be honest, we kind of struggled for the first first leg on the way up to Alaska. We, it, was just, it was running on veggie oil, but it was kind of, it was kind of bogging out. And I just, I didn't have the first clue as to what was going on. It turned out it was super simple. We just had to swap out a filter, but we got to, to Haynes and we, we got to where we were going to spend the next few weeks. And then we realized that the snow wasn't any good. And we decided to drive to Anchorage, which is an extra, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000 kilometers, which round trip really adds up with how much fuel I'm going to be consuming. Because yeah. I was actually towing a trailer with all this vegetable oil in it. So I could pull over on the side of the road whenever I needed to. And then I had a hand pump so I could transfer fuel into my truck and continue on wow. my way. <laughs> but by the time I got up to Anchorage and Girdwood, which is where we were hanging out, uh, I didn't have enough fuel to get home. So I went to the cafeteria and asked the, the kitchen staff if they might have any deep frying oil I could use. And this guy standing in line next to me let me know that there was a guy in Anchorage that was selling 55-gallon drums of veggie oil for 20 bucks, which is a really good deal. Wow, no kidding. Like, so I looked up this guy on Craigslist and went to his house, and he'd been collecting vegetable oil from all the Kentucky Fried Chickens around Anchorage. And he heated his house on it. He dro drove all his vehicles on it. And he had thousands of gallons there. And so he's just trying to get rid of it. So I bought 220 gallons for 80 bucks and drove all the way home smelling like Kentucky Fried Chicken. I, can I ask you this, man? The Alaskan <laughs> Highway is wild. It is, oh, it's a rough road, man. Were animals attracted to you at night? On right? the, were they like, what the heck? I smelled chicken and fries. <laughs> it's I didn't any on that trip, but uh, I definitely, I do have some issues with that at home. <laughs> that is, oh, yeah, because it's there every day. That is too funny. Yep, it's a thing, man. I know that's one of the things is when you're burning that, it, it smells like you're cooking Oh, that yeah. Stuff. It smells great. So your clothes just be, <laughs> just be saturated at this point. Oh, yeah. There was a guy that hopped in my truck. I lent my truck to a friend of mine, and he picked up a friend of his that happened to be allergic to peanut oil. Oh, no. And they were halfway through their trip and realized that he was having a peanut reaction. And uh, thankfully, he had his... Uh, what do you call those pens that you need? <laughs> yeah, the EpiPen. <laughs> the EpiPen, yeah. Oh, my. <laughs> Things you don't think about, man. That's just. Yeah, that's <laughs> it, right? <laughs> yeah, I've been driving that truck now for, what well, about in 2006. So it's been 14 years with that truck now. Man, it, it's, it's yeah. a pretty awesome truck. I've seen some pictures and I'm like, that's a badass looking truck. And to know that it runs off vegetable oil is just 
too cool. Yeah, just too cool. it is. So, yeah, I love it. So, man, you know, that's just one of the things you do for sustainable uh, living. But, you know, like, you know, what are some of the things that you like to practice with, with your body? Because I know not, not terribly long ago, you tell me if I'm wrong, you suffered a knee injury. Yep. And and I also heard you say, and I want to hear why you said this. You said it was liberating to kind of let yeah. go. What did you mean by that? Well, I think when you know I've been a professional skier for so long, and having that kind of career gave me some stability. And as soon as I had that injury, all of a sudden that stability wasn't there for me anymore. All of a sudden, I started worrying about losing my sponsors, losing my career. How am I going to make money? And through that process, realizing that whatever happens is going to happen. And it's really all what you make of it. And realizing that even though I was going to have this injury, and let's say I had to get a completely new career, that I was going to be okay. And I really felt that from deep within myself where all of a sudden the skiing wasn't like that safety blanket had been removed off of me. And I've been left exposed and kind of vulnerable. But all of a sudden through that, I learned how to stand on my own two feet and find a new sense of belief in myself and really starting to discover a new side of myself that, that I hadn't felt before. And, um, and so that was really powerful. And, you know, it was an interesting process because when I first tore my ACL, that's when I started waking up to the fact that, all right, you're probably not going to be a professional skier forever. Right. At some so, point. At some point. Yeah. At some point. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have to figure out what you're going to do next in life. And so that was that was a long process for myself. And I really explored a bunch of different avenues. But throughout all that, I really kind of maintained this knowing that uh, that I was going to be okay. That I was going to be taken care of. And I was going to find this next passion in my life that would um, guide me into this next chapter of my life. Has that changed the way you enjoy skiing? It absolutely has, yep. And, um, and injuries have been so great for that. Two years ago, I had some bone bruising in my tibia plateau. So even though I was going out and I was filming, I was only going out with the intent of skiing one run. And it wasn't going to be a run that was going to be a mind blower. It wasn't going to be an A-plus shot. But I would just go out and find a line that looked like fun. And for me to be able to go out that day and just focus on doing one run that was uh, just fun for me really continued to alleviate the pressure that can come along with being a professional skier and doing it because you want to try to uh, maintain your sponsorships and keep money coming in, you know. And so... There's been all these little experiences along the way that have kind of been um, liberating myself from skiing because it's a job and doing it because I love it. That's a blessing. It's a huge blessing. Mm -hmm. Definitely takes a lot of soul searching, I'm sure, to get to some of those realizations. You know, we get to hear about it on this show in a few minutes, but in reality, yeah. I'm sure it's quite a, quite a process. Oh, yeah. It was years and years and... Um, and I'm a, it's kind of a funny process because I'm, I'm a believer in manifestation and putting my thoughts into what it is I want to do and then striving towards that. And so it was a really tricky process trying to focus in on what my next step in life was going to be, but not knowing what it was. So it really was a process of surrendering and, and being comfortable with being vulnerable and, uh, which can be a really beautiful and liberating experience once you've are able to find comfort there right, right do you, do you find that now i mean are you more confident you know i'll ski for however long and then from there i i know that i can i can i know i can do something else um i would say i've got more comfort with that now just because my life has evolved and changed i do have this other aspect of my life career wise which feels great but i think regardless of that there's always, for me anyhow, there's always little insecurities that are coming up. Well, that just makes you relatable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? And so it's, it's, I can't say it's really getting any easier. Or maybe it's getting a little bit easier for me to understand it and be able to view it. 
but I would say those daily challenges are always there. And uh, but now I, I look at it a little bit a little bit lighter and with a little bit more um, clarity, I suppose. Like I don't take it as uh, as to heart or as much to heart when I have this insecurity coming up. You know, it'll come up. I'll look at it. I'll kind of diagnose it, see why it's there, recognize it, see how I can learn from it, and then I kind of flip it on its head. And then, uh, like for myself, I just I've created these mantras that are basically the the opposition of that that fear or that insecurity. And so I just like repeat these these positive mantras to myself to kind of get myself back into uh, more of a, a positive mindset, so I can keep moving forward in that state of mind, as opposed to moving forward in, in a place of insecurity or negativity, negativity or whatever, whatever it might be. That makes so much sense. You know, it sounds like mindfulness, you know, to, to Mm -hmm. let yourself feel it and just kind of look at yourself and say, you know, it's all right. I'm feeling like this. I'm feeling super insecure and heck everybody else is. (laughs) So what's the heck's the matter? So that's it. And not suppress it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not let yourself feel it. Let yourself feel it and then say, it's okay to feel this, but I don't have to make all my decisions based on the reaction of freaking out about this thing and so yeah that's uh, it. something i've had to learn uh, having to learn i'm not by any yeah. means good at this, <laughs> exactly right. i get a new i get a new chance every day that's for sure <laughs> yeah that's it man and uh, for me that's been such a fun process just trying to figure myself out i love it and and with that just learning the people around me and learning how to communicate more effectively with my friends or or strangers for that matter so it's it's been fun man Breakups and injuries sounds like some yeah, pretty awesome me, times man. in your life. Well, it's usually when you hit hit bottom that you have to uh, that you're left exposed, and all of a sudden you're like, "All right, I, I got to figure this out," you know, because I don't want to stay in this particular state any longer than I have to. And it was interesting because I find I, I almost got into a bit of a pattern back in the day where when I would go down to let's call it rock bottom for lack of better terms, but when I hit rock bottom. I'd pick myself back up and then I'd, you know, go back down. It's a bit of a roller coaster ride, but to the point where I'd come back up, I'd almost be waiting for myself to go back down so I could pick myself back up. But I think, <laughs> which obviously isn't the best way to look at it, but it was just, it was like a bit of a pattern because every time I was coming out of that, that hole, I was coming back up higher. You know, I was like slowly climbing this ladder. I was like two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. And so it was kind of an exciting time in my life initially there whereas now i feel like it's just kind of that roller coaster ride has just kind of gone from kind of a wild ride to more just a mellow um just a mellow wave now you know where i'm just kind of bobbing up and down as opposed to getting rocked up and down you know life life will can I've, I've someone showed me on a graph one time this you know wave it looked like a heartbeat going up and down up and down they said as yeah. you get older you have the opportunity to not be parallel, you know, not essentially go up and down with that roller coaster, but kind of remain steady through. And, and mm-hmm. it was just a really cool illustration of how you become more solid and you don't let those crises, crises freak you out as much yeah. and uh, internally. And, you know, not everyone obviously practices that because I know plenty of older folks that freak out about everything. Mm-hmm. But, um, but no, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome to hear. All right, so first rapid fire question: What are you most curious curious about right now outside of skiing? Um, the brain, the human brain, and figuring out how we can get more neural pathways firing. Oh, dang, that sounds like an episode in itself. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's your proudest achievement outside of your career? Oh, I would say. Um, you know, I'm, I'm most proud of my, my happiness and my health and my relationship with my friends and my family. So, so speaking of that, what is your biggest goal that you haven't yet achieved? Well, I want to figure out how to have a greater impact on, on humanity. I'm still trying to figure out what that avenue is looking like. I'm starting to hone in on it. I just don't really know how to apply it yet. Yeah. It it is honestly more difficult to like choose what to do to make a difference than I thought yeah. it would be. There's a million options. Like I could go to volunteer here or there, but yeah, like, what is yeah. my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing? That that totally despite the day or the activity I'm doing, 
is the yeah. overarching goal of I'm doing this. And yeah, dude, that's, oh my gosh, we could talk about that forever. Yeah, totally. And I've honed in on what it is. Okay. But, yeah, what, totally. what is it? Uh, it's the gut biome, man. Okay. <laughs> Which... <laughs> the gut, you say gut, st- like stomach biome? Yep, totally. Yeah, you really did hone in. Did you know that 90% of our serotonin exists in our gut? But yeah, so literally we have so many bacteria that are in our gut that are directly communicating with our brain. And so if we can start by feeding ourselves food that is going to help create this healthy biome, then that will in turn help our, our mental health. And I think from there, that's where we can really start creating change on this world. When we, when we feel better because we take care of ourselves. And, totally. Yeah. It's like, how are we supposed to help the planet right now when we're not feeling mentally yeah. well? Yeah, dude, I don't know. I'm my, I'm my worst person when I have like a headache or a, a, I'm nauseous. Totally, right? The meanest person yeah. I ever am when I'm not feeling good. <laughs> So yeah, and when that's a, it, seven man. billion people feel yeah. that way, that's gonna make a difference. But uh, holy cow, that's so cool! I guess you are what you eat. Um, <laughs> that's it, man. <laughs> so, so speaking of that, my next question yeah. actually: what was it? What is a health practice that you you do every day? Yeah, you know, for me, quite simply, in the morning, it's starting off with uh, a lemon water. <laughs> okay, and you know what? That's just literally just kind of setting the tone for. Uh, firstly, hydrating myself because our body needs that, our brain needs that. And then lemon water is alkalizing my body. Um, from there, moving forward, I've got a bunch of different concoctions for my morning drinks. But uh, that's kind of just my my foundation. And, you know, I take all sorts of funky mushrooms and algaes and everything else. But I, I find lemon water just a nice, easy way to start the day. You, you ease into it. The mushrooms come later. You yeah, that's ease. it, right? Just a little water, a <laughs> little lemon, keep it simple. Yeah. yeah and I you know, know just <laughs> so many of us are coffee drinkers, right? And and coffee does have its benefits. You know, polyphenols are great for our brain, but it is acidic. So a simple way to balance that out is with some lemon water. You know, it's like our gut will be way happier. Our body is happier. And uh, it's just it's a very simple step that I think will go a long ways. That's good. So how do you live without compromise? You know, my my goal is just to stay true to myself. And that's learning what my values and morals are and, and just doing my best to stick to that. And that comes along with how I treat others and how I treat myself. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Anything you'd like to plug to, to listeners? Let's save it for the next podcast, buddy. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. We got a lot to talk about still. Apparently. Yeah, definitely, so, man. All right. Well, Mark, man, I really appreciate you being on the show and for, you know, just seeing where it goes. You know, I never know where these conversations are going to go. So I, I appreciate it and uh, sharing some words of wisdom for folks. So, so, so thanks for being a part of the athletic brewing team. And uh, yeah, I look forward to talking again at some point. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good night. All man. right. You as well. All right, see you. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.